thing to know his presence, isn't it? Like this, his beautiful, wondrous presence. And I, like Major DeMichael, would love to share a moment or two about how I feel this morning as a, as a blessed one in this room. Many faces, some visitors, who, whose presence in my life uh, have provided the context of grace for my life. You don't know this, but the Ernie's were missionaries in Taiwan when I was just a boy, far from Jesus. And uh, their presence and their witness and their prayer uh, produced the context for me to respond to him, like many others, and many faces across this room. So I'll stop talking about me. I want to talk about Jesus. I know you all have clocks and watches. This has been an astounding service of worship for me. And I hope that you've sensed his wondrous presence reverberating through your life as he has through mine. And I want to get out of the way here and let him speak. Uh, this, this concept of wonder, I think we're not used to it. I think we bump into it like in services like this. And if you, if you haven't, I understand worship differences and styles. But somewhere, the Lord is speaking to all of us. And so wherever that is, I hope you're open to his, his glorious presence, the Holy One. Um, it's not just a Bible study, it's, it's God's word to us. Bible conference, it, it almost sounds like we're critiquing the word or we're assessing something. And what we want to say is, though, the word is, a, is assessing us. He's critiquing us. And when you come to his word like this story of these two, we think, elderly people, we're not quite sure what Simeon's age was. They seem to, to summarize a lot of the Old Testament prophecies, what, what God is looking for. So I want to know in my life what he's looking for. I don't want to, to spend my life spinning my wheels, wasting time. There's no time to waste. Life is too short, especially in the church. And we have all kinds of debates about interpretations and what's going on with the Old Testament. This is just between Testaments. It's the beginning of the new and the end of the old and all that stuff. But in our debates, I think we miss the wonder. And I wish Diane could have just kept on preaching because she says everything just so much more beautifully than I do. I'm just too functional as a man. She's, she lives in wonder and she speaks wonderfully because she knows Jesus so beautifully. But let me just take a few moments here and, and look at this, this chapter with you, this paragraph. Luke 2 is where we're focused today, and because of time, I'm going to have to skip Anna, which I hate. I wanted to close with the woman, because the woman's story is always better than the man's story, but you know, you know how that is, and so just follow through with anything I say about Simeon applies to Anna. In fact, I think she's more intimate than he is in the way she responds. My Bible, by the way, has not she was a 84-year-old uh, widow, my Bible has she was widowed 84 years, which means she was incredibly mature, beautifully mature, and able to see things that most people didn't on the Temple Mount that day. What Don and I have been trying to say in the Gospel of Luke is, we could have taken the whole book and kind of traipsed through, but we stopped and thought, no, there's just so wonder, much wonder in, encapsulated in these first few chapters. Let's slow down. We know it's Christmas stuff. We know it's stuff rehearsed every year. We get kind of used to it. But maybe there's something here for us to be seized again, post-Christmas, about the incarnate one, the incarnate mercy of God revealed to us, the one who is our hope, and today the one who gives to us the business, the business of wonder. Now, what does that mean? As I look at this, this gentleman, Simeon, in chapter 2, I have to go back and say, well, it seems to me like he's in the center of what the Israelite people would call their holy place. I mean, he's just a few feet from it. The court of women was just about 50 yards from the holy of holies. So he's at the very center with the people of God. Nobody could go except the priest forward through that Nicanor gate into the temple itself. So he's just outside, the closest any human being could get to the holy one. And he's there in a very unique time. He's there with people all around him who are trying to get close to God. At least we think they are. Like in church, people who are trying with all of their problems to get close to, to God, the, the one who we know is other than we are and holy and wondrous, but 
we have our stuff, we have our garbage, we have our junk, and they're all trying to do things for God. And he's there, and in this remarkable moment of human history, a young couple come on the scene holding a baby. And they're trying their best to keep the law. I mean, it's incredible if you just do your Bible study of, of recurrences, the word law occurs five times in about three verses. Law, 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 law. Which is Luke's way of saying they were trying to keep the law. And they were doing it in every way they could. We all know about the eight days after birth circumcising a baby boy in Israel. But you may have forgotten that 31 days after birth, the mother had to be purified. So Joseph and Mary come from Bethlehem again, five miles again to the temple to be purified. And that was the day they redeemed their son. That means you had to buy back from God your firstborn. Amazing theological conundrum for me. The first, the son of God redeemed by God as the firstborn of Mary. It's, it's an astounding mix of reality. So she's seeking to be purified. They offer a couple of turtle doves, the poorest of the poor, could at least offer that much to God to redeem their baby boy back. And in this court, we have, I think, the summation of all Israelite religion, all Jewish faith. Think about it. We've got three words. He was righteous. That means he was upright. If you found a man that you could trust, this was your guy. He followed the law to the T. He trusted God. He walked with God. He knew the law. And he was devout, it says. He was righteous and devout which means he not just kept the standards, he was devoted to God. His heart was committed, he was consecrated, he was passionate about this. Now most people would say, hey, that's enough. If I could just find a parishioner in my church that was upstanding and committed to God, that's all I'd need. Just give me a couple people like that. Di and I have been a part of a church for a while. Just give me a couple people like that. It's a beautiful thing when people want to be right, live right, don't debate the law every day, and are committed, devoted, disciplined in their spiritual life. That's what he was, but they're not, it's just beginning. And it says he was looking forward to the consolation of Israel. He was hopeful. I think it means he was positive, not negative. Imagine a person who's positive about life, not negative about everything. I mean, he was so positive, it had been four centuries of nothingness at church, 400 years, he's at the end of four centuries of nothingness at church, and he's still hopeful, still positive. Not waiting for the next preacher, just God may show up today. It's astounding, isn't it, when you, when you meet people who are not kept by culture and by their, their own druthers, they're just, God, what's your law say? I'm committed to you, and I'm hoping you show up. I can't wait till you show up. It changes everything. That's the Old Testament for crying out loud. We haven't even gotten the new yet. And in this amazing, wondrous moment, what do we find? We find a burst of spirit life, of spirit enablement in the middle of a bunch of really good people. That's not the end. That's not the end. The Lord says, it's just the beginning. It's what I've been doing for thousands of years. I've got so much more for you than that. Most of us would settle back and say, hey, if I just had one of those things, I think I'd be okay. But the Lord says, no, I, those are fine, but they point to your deeper need. Let me ask you if you could remember the last testimony you heard from anybody's life, the last time they spoke a, a true Christian testimony. And I bet, because if you heard mine, if I had taken a few moments this morning to tell, it would have been the, pretty much the typical thing. What I was like before Jesus for about seven and a half minutes. And then what I, I become after Jesus for about two minutes. But pretty much nine minutes about me. And very little about God. Maybe it's grace. Maybe Jesus slapped in. But mainly my life my life, which is most of our testimony. We testify to ourselves. But this guy's not about himself. So when he comes on the scene, 
What's written about him is more about God than he. Imagine a testimony like that. Imagine a life that's more about God than ourselves. Now, you and I have done a lot of study over the years about Old Testament spirit, spirit of God there, New Testament spirit of God, especially from Pentecost on, and there's a radical contrast. You've got the Old Testament where the spirit lunges on individuals. That's the word in Hebrew. He lunges on Samson. He lunges on Gideon. He comes upon them, and they become these massive redeemers, powerful people. He comes upon Deborah, and she does amazing things. But then he leaves. He's not there all the time. We see that in Samson. We see that in Saul. He leaves Saul. Can you imagine the horror of the Holy Spirit leaving your life? David says in the middle of his sin, whatever you do, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I want to confess, but I don't know what to quite to say, but don't take your spirit from me. I've seen that happen. I've watched that happen. Don't do that, Lord, whatever you do. It's episodic. It's, 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 it's power-based. All those are beautiful things. But in the new, something is changing. And the word we find in this interesting preposition and the verb in Greek it is the Holy Spirit came upon Simeon and remained. He didn't, he didn't leave. He came upon him, and there's no power act. There's no redeeming act that we can see. He came upon Simeon, and Simeon is, is aware of something brand new, I think. It's interesting how Simeon begins to pray when we we're find here the Holy Spirit's upon him and remains upon him. The first word of his prayer in verse 29 is this word in Greek, despot. Despot. I could show you today on, on the screen five tyrants I know of in the modern world. Our world. Five murderous men. They're called despots in our language. Despot. It's a dirty word. Despot means a tyrant a one and the, and the first word out of his mouth in this moment is lord you're the absolute i'm going to use a word that nobody else uses except in the book of revelation at the end of time you are the lord of lords you're the despot of all you're over all of my life there's no reservation in me none whatsoever when the holy spirit comes upon a person's life and remain they move out of the center. They're, they're moved out of narrowness. And they say, it's not just a typical lordship that people slap on their lives. This is a fundamental lordship with no holds barred, no strings, no reservations, the thing that keep most Christians from any sense of wonder. I, not now, not that way. No, please. And the Lord says, would somebody, think less about me and more about less about themselves and more about me is he the despot of your life i mean the despot and if not i can guarantee you the holy spirit is not upon you the only way the holy spirit would be upon anyone is if their will was yielded to god entirely i think we play this game of christianity Oh, I'm forgiven. Okay, there's the altar, mercy seat. Okay, I, I may need to give up that sin. And the Lord says, oh, please, would you please walk out of this room free of yourself, free of the narrowness of your life? Wonder, true wonder, the wonderful Savior, the wonder, wonderful Creator, this wondrous one, when He comes to us, He lifts us out of our narrowness. And the reason I know why is because the next thing said about Simeon, one is the Holy Spirit came upon him. Second part of his testimony, the Holy Spirit revealed to him. And the word for revealed is the word business. Same word as what happens in the marketplace. The Holy Spirit did business with Simeon. This was the normal transaction of wonder. When the Holy Spirit comes, there's a transaction. It's, it's, a, it's a commerce it's a conversation. A person who's yielded to the despot says, I want your will. I want your plan. This is not my plan. It's your plan. Not my life. This is your life. 
What's your will? What do you want, Lord? What's this day look like to you? How can I join you in the business you're about? And Simeon had such an intimacy with the Spirit, what background I don't know for sure, but a constant, ordinary relationship of dynamic business with God himself. Wesley said it this way, John Wesley. He said, it's interesting, the extraordinary to us as Christians, to God is the ordinary. We always make people who are holy and full of the Spirit strange people. He said, no, no, they're not strange people. They're ordinary people to God. That's the ordinary life. How many of us in churches look for a, a saint somewhere in the pews, normally older, normally train normal all that stuff but not us let them be extraordinary let them be odd i'm going to be normal a normal american christian i'm not going to be too expressive i'm not going to be too unleashed i'm not going to do anything embarrassing and god says well you've defined your own business then it's not my business my business is always viewed by the world as strange you want to submit yourself to the wonderless world you live in? Have at it. No wonder, rationalism, cynicism, and every other ism, you want to live there or do you want to live in wonder? And here's a man in church where no one else, I believe, had the Spirit upon them like he did. And no one talked to God like he talked. God was speaking. And God said, well... My salvation's here. And so Simeon turns. I, I think it was just like this. And he sees Mary holding her baby. She's still in wonder. She's still amazed. She doesn't understand. She knows what's happened nine months ago. And now this baby's here. And he takes her baby. In fact, the early church called him the God Receiver. Just like the Lord showed Diana. She's reading the scripture. He seized wonder into his own arms and says, as you read his marvelous prayer, despot, as you have promised, you now let me go in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. In a 31-day-old baby, this is your salvation. No wonder Christmas we, we spend on everything else but the wonder of the Incarnation. It's hard, it's hard to believe that God would be condensed to the span of a, of a hand. This is your salvation. He's lifted out of narrowness, and he's lifted out of, of everything else in his life, I guess, that I would call self-centeredness. Because as he keeps on praying in the temple, he says this, your salvation, Lord, which you've prepared in the sight of, and here he goes, this is the freaky stuff, all people. Then he adds this, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. No, he said Gentiles on the temple. A word that would have cost any Jew, I think, their neck. And you know why I know that? It's because around the temple, I wish I could show you the picture, they're in the Israeli museum even today, one of 19 stones carved in two languages. If you're a Gentile and you cross this line, you're, you're dead. There was a line, Gentiles out, Jews in. And if you cross the line, you're a dead person. And here's a Jew close to the ark, close to the holy. He's for the Gentile. He's for those people. He's for us, and he's for everybody else across the fence. Every ism is destroyed forever in this prayer. Every salvationist says we will have nothing to do with any barrier of any kind. Let them come in. Because they all need the wonder of Jesus just like we do. And if we dare follow our culture, my dear friends, and I'm not talking politically, so stop. I'm talking spiritually. If we let anything keep anyone from Jesus, we will pay. The Holy Spirit comes and he says, this is my business. The redemption of the world. This is your salvation. Look upon him and offer him to the Gentiles. Thank God that includes you and me today. We're in. We're in. He's a pawn to me. He leads him. But he's not.
not done yet. The third part of his testimony is this. Excuse me. He's upon him. He reveals to him. Third part is he leaves him. Isn't that beautiful? It's not just a weird thing. Some guy talking out of nowhere. The Holy Spirit led him. He can lead a person who's open to his will, who does business with him, the business of wonder. He can lead a person, not some strange person walking around with their heads in the clouds. I don't think. I think this is just a normal guy with a normal life. As Diane spoke a moment ago, doing wonder at work, the wonder of God at work, in a church, in a church meeting, or maybe in a boardroom where you when you leave this church and you go to a classroom, could, could anybody here say, Lord, you know, my days are not filled with wonder. They're not filled with your spirit. They're full of my spirit, my agenda. I come in narrow. I don't see what you're doing. I come in self-centered. I don't care about anybody else except myself. And Lord, I don't need your leading. I think I'm doing pretty well in life. And God says, well, you can have your own life then. You can have a fruitless, empty non-eternal, non-powerful life if you'd like. But I'm looking for somebody who says, I don't know what that preacher's talking about, but Lord, I need you in my life in a way I've never experienced him. Or maybe I did once and I sinned that away or I, I gave it up or I stopped feeling like I was out of control. Whatever, whatever excuses we make, what if that morning, Simeon had gotten up, had his devotions, devout like he was, and before he got, he said, you know, I'm going to have another cup of coffee, or I'm going to go back for 10 minutes, I'm going to hit his alarm for the 10, snooze. What if he'd not been led by the Spirit that day? What if he'd said, I'm doing my own thing this morning? God loves me. He would have missed the Savior. And I feel like, I know I'm not a legalist. I hope you don't think I am, and I hope you're not. That's ridiculous. But there's something about the leading of God where you can come so close to who he is that when he speaks, you move. When, when he speaks to speak, you speak. You, you're so close. Your business, his business is your business, and he's upon you, and he's guiding you, and he's revealing, and, and he can lead. And when he leads, then all of a sudden, Life comes, and life for somebody else comes, and it stops being about me and my life and my retirement and my place, and do people notice me? It's just, it's a testimony about God. I don't know if there's another verse in the Bible more beautiful than this, where you have virtually in about 25 words three things said about the Spirit more than a man. Find me one place in the Bible where there's more about God than a person like this. Upon him, revealed to him, led him. Is that your testimony? Is that mine? So we can say, okay, we're going to close the service, sing a song, we know the ropes, do it again, leave. Or say, Lord, you did something in a morning, we think, where the salvation of God shows up in swaddling clothes and a man says those people in Clearwater one day will know your salvation keep leading I wonder why we're called the Salvation Army I wonder why we have the honor of that name could it be that they're just a bunch of oddly dressed people who do worship in very intriguing ways in our modern culture who say, you know what? You can laugh at us all you'd like. We are here for one purpose. See his salvation. He's upon us. We do business with him. It's his business, not our business. And he's leading. He leads. He's leading right now. And if he's not, I just want to invite you. I want to invite you to his leading, his presence. If you've never known that, don't be afraid. There's freedom. Freedom from narrowness, freedom from self-centeredness, and freedom from hopelessness. Let me end with this. 
I've got so much more to say, but no time. It's intriguing. As Simeon keeps thinking, he looks to Mary and says this. After he prays, he says, Ma'am, a sword is going to go through your heart. Thinking about the cross. Ma'am, this baby's going to die. A sword's going to go through your soul. Prophet, the first prophecy, clear prophecy of the cross, this man sees. Then he says this, that the thoughts, the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Intrigued by that. The little digging. That word thoughts is the word dialogue, which happens every Sunday morning about this time in every one of our hearts. A dialogue. I've worshipped, I've heard the word preached, and now, and this is the word seven times in the New Testament, every time negative, the debate starts. I debate. I debate. That's the word that Simeon says, that the debating hearts will be revealed. And that's what he does. Jesus, every time. He will bring something to our attention, something not like him, the Spirit of God, that's his business. He brings it to us, and we can say, nope, not today, not good enough service, not good enough preacher, I'm going out to do my own thing. Or, the debate's over. No more debate. I want the dialogue to be one the Spirit initiates. Come upon me. Reveal to me. Lead me. I hope that as you leave today, that is your testimony. Would you stand with me? Would you stand and let's sing together a beautiful, beautiful song that Commissioner Cooper is going to play for us, 290. I want to ask Michael to come as your pastor, one of your pastors to come and lead us. 290, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. And if you'd like to come and pray, this place of wonder, this place of mercy is here for you. Would you come as the Holy Spirit leads?